This lecture will be covering chapters 10, 11, and 12. Chapter 10, Illegal Agreements. If you're following along in your textbook, we'll start with 10-1, Contracts Prohibited by Statute. Contracts for the Sale of Prohibited Articles. Contracts in Unreasonable Restraint of Trade. So, contracts not to compete. Contracts to limit competition. Contracts to fix the resale price. Unfair competitive practices. These are all contracts that are not going to be allowed by law. 10.1.G, Administrative Agency Orders. This refers back to Chapter 4. Contracts that are contrary to public policy, such as contracts limiting freedom of marriage, contracts obstructing the administration of justice, and contracts injuring public service. These are all contracts that are going to be prohibited by law because they either are against public policy or they somehow unlawfully restrain free trade. Let's cover the questions at the end of chapter 10. 10.1. Does a contract that is void for illegality necessarily involve the commission of a crime? This is question 1 of chapter 10. The answer is no. A contract is void for illegality may consist merely of a private wrong. Question 2. With regard to illegality of a contract, what is the difference between a divisible and indivisible contract? If a contract is indivisible, illegality in one part renders the whole contract invalid. If the contract is divisible, the legal parts of the contract are enforceable. Question 3. What is the general rule regarding what courts do when faced with a controversy between the parties to a private gambling contract? When faced with a controversy between parties to a private gambling contract, courts will leave the parties where it finds them and will not allow one party to recover damages from the other, from the other for breach of a gambling debt. Question 4. Why is it that the types of transactions one observes being undertaken on Sunday do not necessarily indicate restric restrictions imposed by what are, what are known as Sunday acts? The types of transactions one observes being undertaken on Sunday do not necessarily indicate restrictions imposed by Sunday acts because the violators of Sunday acts are seldom prosecuted. Question 5. Why are most statutes making it illegal to operate certain types of businesses or professions without a license enacted? Most statutes making it illegal to operate certain types of businesses or professions without a license are enacted to protect the public from incompetent operators. Question 6. Why are non-compete contracts that have restrictions that go further or longer than necessary to protect the buyer of the business unlawful? 
non compete contracts that have restrictions that go further or longer than necessary to protect the buyer of the business are unlawful because they burden the seller and because they deprive the business community and society in general of the benefit of the activities of the seller. Question 7. What is the effect of a contract to divide up trade territory that affects interstate commerce? A contract to divide up trade territory that affects interstate commerce is declared illegal by the Sherman Antitrust Act or the Clayton Act. Question 8. What are the consequences of a contract to seek a divorce for consideration? A contract to seek a divorce for consideration is void as against public policy. Question 9. Under what circumstances will a contract that may obstruct our legal processes be void? Any contract that may obstruct our legal processes will be void when it has the tendency to obstruct justice even if justice is not actually obstructed. Question 10. Give three examples of contracts that injure public service. Examples of contracts that injure public service include a contract to use improper influence to obtain the passage of a bill, use one's influence in obtaining a public contract that by statute must let the lowest responsible bidder have the contract, or obtain pardons and paroles or pay public officials more or less that the statute for that particular salary allows. Chapter 11 covers written contracts. 11-1 reasons for written contracts. Existence of a contract cannot be denied if it is in writing. Terms of the contract can be ascertained. A written contract is more reliable evidence than oral evidence. 11-2 statute of frauds. The following agreements must be written. An agreement to sell land or any interest in or concerning land must be in writing. An agreement the terms of which cannot be performed within one year from the time it is made. An agreement to become responsible for the debts or default of another. These are all contracts that have to be in writing. An agreement of an executor or an administrator to pay the debts of the estate from the executor or the administrator's personal funds. An agreement containing a promise in consideration of marriage. An agreement for the sale of goods over $500. And we'll talk about that more in Chapter 17. Again, these are all contracts that must be in writing pursuant to the statute of frauds. Note or memorandum in writing is required when one party sues the other for a breach of contract. This is 11-3 regarding note or memorandum. A memorandum must contain all the essential terms of the contract. So pursuant to the statute of frauds, certain agreements have to be in writing, but they don't necessarily have to meet all the requirements of a contract. A note or memorandum can satisfy the statute of frauds. 
11-4 other written contracts, state specific written contracts such as the sale of securities, agreements to pay a commission to a real estate broker, a new promise to extend the statute of limitations. 11-5 discusses the parole evidence rule. A complete written contract may not be modified by oral testimony unless evidence of fraud, accident, or mistake exists. Let's cover the questions at the end of this chapter. Chapter 11, question 1. What advantage does a written contract have over an oral contract? Provided it includes all the terms and provisions of the agreement, a written contract has the advantages over an oral contract that its existence cannot be denied and that its terms can be ascertained. Question 2. Under what circumstances will the courts allow enforcement of an oral contract required by the statute of frauds to be in writing? Courts will allow enforcement of an oral contract required by the statute of frauds to be in writing if one party has made part performance and would be hurt if the contract was not enforced. Question 3. Give three examples of contracts not involving the sale of land but only an interest in land that the statute of frauds requires to be in writing. Examples of contracts not involving the sale of land but only an interest in the land that the statute of frauds requires to be in writing involve right-of-ways, joint use of driveways, mineral rights, timber or lease of real property for more than a year. Question 4. Why must a contract that cannot be performed in one year be in writing to be enforceable? A contract that cannot be performed in one year must be in writing to be enforceable since it might easily be forgotten before the contract is completed. To minimize the need to resort to the courts because the parties do not remember the terms of the contract, such contracts must be written. Question 5. Under what circumstances is the statute of frauds requirement of a writing unnecessary when a person agrees to be responsible for the debt of another? The statute of frauds requirement of a writing when a person agrees to be responsible for the debt of another is unnecessary when the main purpose of the promise is to gain some advantage for the promisor. Question 6. When a party sues to enforce an alleged contract, what is the requirement of the statute of frauds regarding the evidence of an agreement of the parties to an alleged contract? When a party sues to enforce an alleged contract, the statute of frauds requires that the agreement of the parties be evidenced either by a writing signed by both parties or that there is a note or memorandum in writing signed by the party against whom the claim for breach of contract is made. Question 7. What must be included in a note or memorandum required by the statute of frauds? The note or memorandum required by the statute of frauds must include all the essential terms of the contract. Question 8. When must the note or memorandum required by the statute of frauds have been made? The note or memorandum required by the statute of frauds must have been made by the time the suit is brought. Question 9. 
when will the parole evidence rule permit modification of a written contract that appears to be complete by another writing made before or at the time of executing the contract? The parole evidence rule will allow another writing made before or at the time of executing a contract to be modified, a written contract that appears to be complete when the contract refers to other writings and indicates they are considered as incorporated into the contract. Question 10. If a written contract is not complete, will courts admit oral evidence? If a written contract is not complete, courts will admit oral evidence to clear up ambiguity or to show the existence of trade customs that are to be regarded as forming part of the contract. Chapter 12, Third Parties and Contracts, 12-1, Involving a Third Party. Third Party Beneficiary is a person not party to a contract but whom the parties intended to benefit. A third party can enforce a contract against the promisor. Novation is the termination of a contract and the substitution of a new one with the same terms but with a new party. The new obligor is solely liable. Assignment of a contract, conveyance of rights in a contract to a person, not a party. Assignment of rights depends on their nature and the terms of the contract. Delegation of a contract is the transfer of duties without the rights. It is delegated to the party and that party is fully responsible or liable. Assignment and delegation can be specified in the contract. 12-2, Technicalities of an Assignment, Notice of Assignment. There is no notice needed for assignment to be effective. Generally, the law gives priority in the order the assignments were made. Form of the assignment can be made either by operation of law or by act of the parties. If original contract is written, the assignment must also be written. The effect of an assignment transfers all the rights, title, or interest held by the assignor to the assignee. 12-2D, Warranties of the Assignor. The assignor is the true owner of the right. The right is valid and subsisting at the time the assignment is made. There are no defenses available to the debtor which have not been disclosed to the assignee. Joint several and joint and several contracts. 12-3A, Joint Contracts. A contract obligating or entitling two or more people together to performance. Several contracts is a contract where two or more people individually agree to perform obligations. 12-3C, Joint and several contracts is where two or more people are bound jointly and individually to the obligations of the contract. 
Let's go over the questions at the end of chapter 12. Chapter 12, question 1. What is the rule regarding the ability of a person, not a party to a contract, to enforce a contract? A third person who is expressly benefited by the performance of a contract may enforce it against the promisor if the contracting parties intended to benefit the third party. Question two, what is the difference between a creditor beneficiary and a donee beneficiary? The difference between a creditor beneficiary and a donee beneficiary is that the promisee owes a legal duty to the creditor beneficiary, which is discharged to the extent the promisor performs the promise. The promisee owes no legal duty to a donee beneficiary. Question three, may everyone who benefits by the performance of a contract between others successfully sue for breach or performance of the contract? No, if a person merely incidentally benefits by the performance of a contract, suit for breach or performance will not be successful. Question four, when a novation occurs, what happens to the parties to the contract? When a novation occurs, the original obligor drops out of the contract and the new party takes the original obligor's place and is alone liable for the performance of the contract. Question five, how easily may a party's rights under a contract be assigned? As a general rule, a party's rights under a contract may be assigned almost as freely as property. However, statutes may impose restrictions on the assignment of wages of persons, such as those in the military, public officials, and public works employees. Question six, what is the difference between an assignment of a contract and the delegation of duties under it? An assignment is the transfer of rights in a contract, while a delegation is strictly a transfer of the duties of a contract. Question seven, in what way does an assignment or transfer modify rights or duties transferred? An assignment or transfer cannot modify rights transferred by assignment and duties transferred by delegation. They remain the same, as though only the original parties to the contract were involved. Question eight, what is it called when one party to a contract transfers the contract in its entirety to another? When one party to a contract transfers the contract in its entirety to another, it is an assignment of the rights and the delegation of duties. Question nine, how is an assignment made by operation of law? An assignment is made by operation of law in the event of death when the law assigns the rights and duties of the deceased to the executor or the administrator of the estate, or in the event of bankruptcy when the law assigns the rights and duties of the debtor to the trustee in bankruptcy. Question ten, if Rich jointly promises to pay $10,000 with Sharon and Andrew severally promises to pay $10,000, who will have to pay more? Well, if Rich jointly promises to pay $10,000 with Sharon and Andrew severally promises to pay $10,000, 
Andrew will have to pay more. Rich and Sharon are each bound to pay only $5,000 each, where Andrew will have to pay the entire 10000